Hey, thanks so much for joining us for the weekly message for Connection Church. My name is Steve. Hopefully, hopefully you are enjoying the summer so far. We are a couple weeks now into July and and we're looking forward to some fantastic things coming up this summer, both our family, but also as a church. We have church camping coming up. It's going to be so good. We have another celebration Sunday coming up. It's going to be so good. We have baptism coming up in uh, another couple months, September 1st weekend. We are so excited about that as well. Uh, I'm also excited about the fact that we are in this series called Heroes right now. You're catching us on week two. And last week we looked at Abel, this guy Abel. The whole reason we're looking into some heroes of the faith uh, and, and kind of like starting out of uh, for each week, this section in Hebrews 11 that speaks of heroes of the faith. Really, this kind of like concept of how the inspiration from heroes of the faith can help us deepen our roots of faith, right? Not, not for looking at them and comparing and thinking, wow, I'm what am I doing with my faith? Like, I'm really not good. But looking at these examples of faith and, and asking God to help us be inspired by them, right? To implement some of the things that we see them do in our lives and then therefore deepen our roots of faith and, and hopefully make some great change that better reflects Jesus in our life. And that's kind of kind of the point that I want to start with is a question. What do you want from your life? Like, what do you want said of you when you're gone? I know that's a little bit of a bleak uh, question, but it's one thing to kind of answer that with what we think we want or what we would say to that. But the other part of that question is, what does our life reflect in that concept of how we want to be remembered? Because we can give lip service to something and say, oh, you know what? It would be great to be remembered for this or to be this type of person. But sometimes our life doesn't actually reflect that that's what we want. We might know it in our head, but we don't actually live it out from our actions, from kind of like an overflow of the heart we act most often. And so, what is it that our lives say about how we want to be remembered? Because I think that's a really key aspect to why we would look at these heroes of the faith, that we would pattern our lives first and foremost after Jesus, but then also these heroes of the faith. So we looked at Abel last week and kind of the whole topic of offerings, right? How we would offer different aspects of our life to Jesus and really our whole life back to him. But we can say that's another thing that we're quick to maybe say we want to do. But then when we divide it up, we look at some areas of our life are really easy to hand over and surrender and offer back to him. And other areas are really hard. And maybe we go through the motions and it's void of emotion, right? We're not passionately offering God our best in that area. Anyways, that was last week. Go check out last week's message if you missed that one. This week, we're going to take a look at a guy that most of you know. And we're going to get into that by reading, uh, again, another section from Hebrews 11, which is where we're kind of springboarding out of and then taking a deeper look at each person that we're kind of taking some time to look at in another section of Scripture that describes uh, a little bit more about their life. But before we read this, I'm going to pray, ask us, uh, ask God to help us be present and um, yeah, a few other things. So let's pray. God, thank you for this time that we can uh, maybe be with groups if people are within groups or maybe just on their own watching this message. God, whatever it is, the situation that we're in, God, I just ask that you would help us to be present in the moment. There's so many things vying for our attention, and I just ask that you would help us to be present and open to hear from you as we look at your word and as we engage in conversation about it after. Thank you for your patience with us and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so grab your Bible. Hopefully you have a physical Bible. Again, we always encourage you 
always encourage you, have a physical Bible, right? Have one that you're going to underline, that you make, make notes in, bookmarks, whatever you're going to do. Um, but we're, we're looking at Hebrews 11, and I want to jump down to verse 7, because this zeroes in on who we're going to look at today. It says this, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, super important, this aspect, as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So just a couple quick little things. So by faith, because of Noah's faith, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen. This, this is what's so key about what we were, we're going to zero in on today is when, when God is speaking to you about something in your life that is to come that is yet unseen. Maybe that's what we read about in scripture. Okay. Maybe it's something you read about that's said of, uh, of Jesus followers, the inheritance we have. Maybe it's, you know, heaven that is to come. Maybe it's just something that God is calling you into a next step in life. It is something that is unseen, unexperienced yet. There are so many things that can pop up in our life as to why we might hesitate or delay life or just avoid that thing altogether because we haven't seen it or experienced it. Maybe some things pop up as to why we don't step into it. But because of his faith and being warned by God in reverent fear, so Noah's faith was really had this foundation of reverent fear for God that helped him trust God in this situation that was surrounding events that were yet unseen, right? And it says, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. And so again, circling back around to our question of like, what do you want said of your life after you're done living it? There's so many things that the world offers us that we can go after because we're surrounded by people who are going after those things. But man, we want, as Jesus followers, we want to be remembered for the faith that we had. The faith that we had that influenced others. And so we look at Noah and how he lived his life. And we're going to look at Noah. And, and it's an inspiration to us. And it was credited to him because of his great faith. So we're going to flip way back in, in Scripture to Genesis 6. And this is where we're going to, we're going to look at this whole chapter. We're going to breeze through a few things. Uh, and we're going to camp in some others just to kind of get a greater sense of how this came about and what caused Noah to have the faith that he had and, and be given right standing in one sense with God. Because we want those things said of us as well as we try to better reflect Jesus to others. So Genesis 6, starting in verse 1, says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Now, some confusing things in this section that we're going to look at. Some of them um, may be just better understood in different translations. Um, some of them are just, they're just tough to understand. And, and that's okay. We're going to get into a couple of them in a minute. But first off, the sons of God. So different people believe different things of this statement, sons of God. Some would say, oh, that's describing the kids through Seth's line. But that really doesn't hold a whole lot of water, especially when you look at where else this is used. Most commentators believe that this sons of God phrase is fallen angels. Okay, so saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any that they chose. Maybe you've read this before, maybe not. Maybe this is blowing your mind a little bit as to, wow, this sounds crazy, like right out of comic books or movies or whatever. It's not entertainment value. 
it is something that we need to be looking at as to like what is going on in here. And we see this is not a good thing. Okay, so the fallen angels, the sons of God, saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. Another confusing little bit here, but another way of phrasing that is, "Will my spirit shall not contend with man forever. And there's this idea of like governance and presence with and almost this like, uh, yeah, like a dance almost, a partnership. My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. There's a few things that can that people say is, is meant by this. Really, we just need to take from this that things, because of what has gone on, the relationship with God is changing. And we're seeing this sort of to another degree. Adam and Eve in the garden, they made some selfish choices, some sinful choices, and the relationship with God changed. It took a shift. And here we're seeing it again. Because of some demonic influence that was allowed in, there, there began to be changes in the human population and their choices, and we're going to see that in a sec, and it meant a change in the relationship with God. Anyways, it continues. We'll get into that in a sec. It continues. His days shall be 120 years. Now, this could also be confusing because you just, if you look at this and you think, okay, so people are only going to live to about 120 now. Well, if you continue in scripture for a lot, a lot of years, people lived way past 120. So one idea is that this statement, his days shall be 120 years, is is that this is kind of the timeline that's left for humanity before the flood. And, and as you look at numbers and you look at ages of, of Noah before and, and then when the flood hits, it's about 120 uh, years. And so that does kind of stand. Verse 4, we're going to get into some other things here. It says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. So again, we're looking out of the ESV, which is a translation that's a little more word for word. If you look at the New Living Translation, which is uh, a little bit different, it's thought, um, thought by thought, which is very helpful in some circumstances. This may be one of them because it kind of moves things around a little bit to get the idea that the Nephilim are those who were born from the women who were with these fallen angels, these sons of God, which verse four continues, these, so the Nephilim, were these mighty men of old, the men of renown. There's so much in here that we could like just bunny trail off on. And if you, in your groups, you might do that. You might kind of want to camp on a section here after you, you know, circle back around to it or something, but some really interesting things to, to, to dig into. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Okay, so we see here that again, it's influence from the enemy that's causing things that are contrary to God to start to grow. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man, talk about saying they were just completely bad, right? Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, what's scary is that we're not far off. And maybe you buck against that because you just think our society's not all evil all the time. Well, we have this view of evil, and I think some of it comes from Hollywood. Some of it comes from just ideas in our head where we read stories or something where evil is described as this overtly violent and negative and clearly bad uh, thing. It's not always the case. Evil is just something that is against God or without God, right? There's good, which is God, and there's evil, which is things that are not of God. And so you look at a society that is becoming more and more focused on self, and it is in everything you need is in you. That doesn't overtly come across as evil, 
but it absolutely is if it's void of God. And so you look at something, something like Matthew 24, 37, Jesus is saying, as the days of Noah were, so also will be essentially the days of when the Son of Man returns. And so you look at like, all these things are found in this chapter, but exploding population, sexual perversion, demonic activity, constant evil in the heart of man, and widespread corruption and violence. And you go, check, 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 check. And you go through the whole list and go, shoot, this age is looking very much like the days of Noah. Okay, verse 6, keep it going. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Okay, full stop here, because this is a really tough one to chew through. And at least for me, it was a really tough one to chew through. Because at a surface level, you're thinking, hold on, when I regret something, I'm admitting that I made a mistake, largely. So is God admitting that he made a mistake? I mean, God doesn't make mistakes. So God isn't admitting that he made a mistake because we see Revelation 13, 8 speaks of Jesus being the lamb slain before time, before the foundations of the earth. And so God knew all this was going to unfold. So you just think, okay, why is this wording being used then? For God. I can't, I can't get away from the fact that here we are, human beings, trying to explain in our human terms God's reaction and emotional response to something. God's emotional response. Like God, this divine, incredibly complex being, we're trying to kind of like funnel down and put our words and understanding on his emotional reaction here. And so it's not on us to try and point out and say, oh, well, God obviously made a mistake. It's not the point of this scripture. This scripture is saying, listen, God is so emotionally involved with his creation that it causes him grieving. It causes him sorrow and heartache. And it causes him such emotion that we would relate to a word like regret. And so, man, what an awesome moment to see that the creator just cares that much about his created. And you would say, well, if he cared for them, why is he about to wipe them out? Because he wants them to be living out his best for them. And that's so true for us. That there's all kinds of choices we can make in life that we think, man, if God loves me, he'll give me what I want. And if you've been a kid with a parent, maybe you're a parent of kids, and you know that that's actually not true, right? Parents, good parents who are trying to healthily raise their kids well, don't give their kids everything they want. They want the best for their kids of, of healthy choices and things like that. And so we see mankind getting to a point of kind of no return. Anyways, verse seven. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. He is, he is grieving at what is in front of him, what has happened. Now, just jumping back really quickly and just an aside, we actually don't have a concrete timeline for when Satan rebelled and was thrown out of heaven with his fallen angels. I mean, we would look to this and say, well, this obviously happened sometime surrounding this because we see that they're on the earth. And so is God also grieving, not just humankind's decision, but also grieving the fallen angels' decisions and their influence on man, and that we, potentially desiring more power like Eve in the garden and Adam as well, that maybe humans' choices to partner with the demonic because they offer something more is really what's gotten us into trouble as well. So, 
finishing the verse 8, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And here we have to just ask, why? Why did Noah find favor in the eyes of the Lord? Now, it would be easy to just say, well, he obviously wasn't, his intentions weren't only evil all the time continually, but there has to be more. And so we see this as we keep going here. And this little section is Noah and the flood. Verse nine, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Hold on to that. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Okay, so there's a couple things we need to just pause here on because they are very key to why Noah was the way he was and why he was able to achieve the standing he had and the recognition he had in this hall of fame, faith, faith hall of fame that we're kind of looking at. So just looking at these things initially, a righteous man, this word just means lawful, right? He obeyed the law. He put God's law, which wasn't in stone yet, but it was on his heart, God's ways above his own. And this is an immediate stumbling block for us at times because we elevate our own ways above God's and we are struggling with this in certain seasons. So he was a righteous man. He was someone that elevated God's ways above his. Blameless in his generation. This doesn't mean that Noah was sinless because we know that no human being other than Jesus was sinless. And so this idea of blameless, when you look at this word, it has this idea of like wholeness. And, and when you think of your own walk with Jesus, when I think of my own walk with Jesus, when I make mistakes, my wholeness before God feels compromised, like a piece has been torn out of me, right? I've decided to do th something selfishly. I've elevated my wants, my ways above God's, and I'm, I'm no longer whole. I've given a part of me away to that selfish thought, action, or word. And so this idea of being blameless, of being whole, is not this idea that Noah is sinless and he never made any mistakes, but it's that he was whole before God. And you just kind of think, how is that even possible? Well, in the same way that we can have that same feeling and that same reality, and it's in that next sentence, Noah walked with God. So this idea does not, or this, this sentence, doesn't mean that Noah like went for long walks on the beach with the Lord physically. Okay, this idea is also found when it speaks of Enoch and it says he walked with God. This idea is that he pleased God. Okay, and so when we look at this, this idea of pleasing God, we see that God desires relationship above action. Relationship leads to action, not action leading to relationship. Like we so often confuse and get backwards. We want to check a whole bunch of boxes so that we can have this relationship with Jesus. But it doesn't work that way. A relationship with Jesus that we, we pour our energy into, we surrender our whole life, that is what changes our actions to come alongside and more align with God's ways. And so Noah walked with God. Noah had this relationship with God this continual walking out of a relationship with God. This word walked with God is also used when it talks of the flood and it says uh, when it's receding, it says it continually receded. This almost like, like it walked it out. It, it, it was this thing that was continual. So Noah walked with God. It, it's a common thing for us to talk about because we're on this side of Jesus. But what an incredible thing. And it's why Noah's faith is spoken of so highly because he's on that side of Jesus and we're on this side of Jesus. We look at scripture and we see all that Jesus said and did for us and it's fuel for our relationship with him, for us to walk with him. 
Noah. Noah was before all that. So it makes his walking out of his relationship with God all the more incredible. Made possible, though, because he elevates God's ways and he continues in relationship with him, addressing the things that he would have done wrong. And that is how he has his wholeness, this idea of being blameless. So verse 10, and now Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. So it's circling back around to kind of what the focus is here. And the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So here, here God is saying, listen, this, it wasn't just something you could pin on the fallen angels. Humankind had decided, okay? And we do the same thing. Anytime we're choosing self over what God wants, our selfish, sinful desires over what God is calling us to, we're partnering with the enemy. It's We're doing what he wants. And then we have to live out the ramifications of things, which is awful and sometimes leaving, leaves us scratching our heads going, what's going on here? Verse 13, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence and through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. This is the first of these things that Noah is yet to see, right? That we read about in Hebrews 11, that God is going to destroy the earth. Like, what? Can you imagine what Noah's mind is doing in this moment? I mean, he's got this steady relationship with God who he's known to be a loving, caring God. And all of a sudden, God is saying, I'm going to make an end to all flesh. I will destroy them with the earth. So verses 14 to 16, uh, we see the details for God's instructions for the ark. And he continues, For behold, I will bring a flood waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the bread of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds and the animals, he continues. And verse 21, I'll also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. In verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Man, there's no record of Noah, of Noah saying, what? Are you serious, God? No. Or, or fighting with God in this or defending humankind. And we have no idea why. Maybe Noah was picked on, bullied and, and, you know, had, acts of violence committed against him and his family. And he was like, yeah, you know what? Tough to argue, God, because everyone is violent and, 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 and evil. Noah did this. Noah was about to embark on making this massive boat so big that it just didn't make sense. He was doing it because of an event that is unlike anything he had ever seen or experienced. But it was because of his trust in God that he did this. He did all that God commanded of him. He trusted God. His faith in God was well established because he elevated God's ways and because of how he became blameless. He stayed whole with God in that repentance and confession was would have been part of his, his walk with God that was continual. Noah was tasked to do something based on having a load of trust in the Lord. And you just think, okay, that's great. That's great that he had a load of trust in the Lord. I don't know that I have all that. 
Why? What are the reasons that we don't trust the Lord? I mean, it's a good question to tackle because we want, as Jesus followers, we want to trust God. We want to trust him at his word because why else? Why else are we putting time and energy into a faith if we don't actually trust the creator? Kind of seems pointless. So how do we increase that trust? Well, we have to look at the things that are taking away from that trust. One, I got to say, is just busyness. If we're not spending time with the Lord, reading his word, praying, and just spending time journaling, listening to him, that whole walking with him, if we're not doing that well, we're not going to build trust with God. Think of the people that you have the most trust in. They're people that you've lived life with, spent time with, gone through moments that were trust-building moments. And that's another aspect. So not only do we need to be continuing in our relationship of, of pursuing God and spending time with Jesus, but we have, to, we have to recognize and remember the moments that he has given us for trust-building moments, the times where he's come through in the past, where he's done things that you maybe prayed for, or done things that you didn't pray for, but were things that you needed. We need trust in God because he's calling us to things. Maybe this is familiar to you already, that he's calling you to something in the future, the near future maybe, that you're not sure about because you've never seen them, you've never experienced them, and you're not sure if your faith will cause you to step into them or to step around them. I think God is, is continually speaking to us all the time through his word, but also out of our time with him. And I think he's trying to reveal things to us. But again, we're too busy sometimes to um, hear him or to take time for the details. When you look at the story of Job, we see in a number of the chapters, this back and forth conversation as Job is processing things and, and as God is responding to Job in this, we see a very different thing with Noah here. He is listening. He's not responding. He's not interjecting. He is listening. And I think that's a massive element for us also building trust and faith in God and setting down much deeper roots is how attentive we are to listen to him as he speaks to us of what is to come. Noah doesn't say he has any self-confidence issues, right? Of like, oh, I can't do this. There's no way. Who am I? You know, we see something like that in Moses, right? When God begins to un unveil his plan and Moses is like, whoa, I can't do that. Noah doesn't seem to say any of that or think that the odds are stacked against him. I can't build a boat that's that massive, or God, this just seems a little crazy. He simply steps into it. Now, does Noah, does that mean that Noah doesn't have any fear? No, it doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't have fear, because trust isn't necessarily the absence of fear. It's maybe the confidence despite fear. And so we see Noah stepping into this. Listen, Noah is unique. No one else has been asked to build a boat because the earth is going to be flooded. But you be sure of this, that every Jesus follower who is looking to God to be the center of their life and surrender their whole life to Jesus, God is speaking to them. God is speaking to us through his Holy Spirit, revealing things to us trying to reveal things to us of what is to come, of what, is, what he's calling us into. And this doesn't have to just be big things. This can be in little conversations that are coming up. As we walk with the Lord, he begins to reveal things to us. Maybe what he wants us to say in a work conversation. Maybe what he wants us to do as we jump in on that sports team that we're, we're part of. God is constantly trying to reveal what he's calling us to. And yes, some of it can be things we've never seen and never experienced. But our faith, our walk with God, 
leads us into those things. The enemy will use all kinds of tactics to get you to avoid or delay what God is calling you into. But the key for Noah is the key for us, and that's our proximity to the Lord. And so we circle back around and we see that righteousness. How is your righteousness these days? This idea of elevating God's ways above your ways. How's your righteousness doing? And in in the context of what we see described for Noah in being blameless, in being whole because of his walk with God, how are you doing with confession and repentance? Because I promise you, if, if there are struggles in your life, which there are for all of us, if there are weaknesses and temptations and moments of mistakes, we can be left feeling far less than whole in front of God. But that's not what he's calling us to. He's given us incredible ways and opportunities to be before him and say, God, I I messed up. And in the name of Jesus, I repent for this that I thought or this that I did or this that I said. Please forgive me. And he begins to piece us back together in those ways that we have felt less than whole. And lastly, just this whole concept of he walked with God, that that our number one thing would be to please God and to continue with him. I think sometimes we get caught up in the actions of faith and we think, well, I've surrendered my life to God and I I wanna make sure the things that I'm doing are right and not wrong. But sometimes I think there's an element of, would this please God? can be different than just merely the right or wrong question. Would this please God? Or you look at you as a kid, to your parents, you know there were things that you could do that would be right or wrong. And you could maybe for the most of your time stay in the right camp. But there are also things that you could do to please your parents. And I wonder how much of our time in our pursuit of Jesus, we're concerned with this, that I wanna please God. I wanna please Jesus because of all that he's done for me. I not only wanna be righteous, I not only wanna be whole and and confess and repent where I've gone wrong, but I want my life to please Jesus. Man, what an element that is. So how are you currently doing with this? What things are getting in the way? And where do you need to make adjustments? This is so key and so critical that we ask these questions not only just of ourselves, but in a faith community. I hope you're part of one. I hope you're actually part of a group right now and you're about to dig into this. And if not, please reach out to somebody of faith that you can talk through some of this with because it is life-changing. And it absolutely means so much to the legacy that we build and we leave behind as an impact for others. That we would be remembered for the faith that we had, that made much of God and not much of ourselves. Okay, we're going to wrap it up right there. I'm going to pray and then we'll let you go. God, thank you so much again for your patience with us. A people who, again, we have found our society to be so close to the society that surrounded Noah, that grieved your heart. Please forgive us for the ways that we have thought, spoken, and acted in ways that are not honoring to you, that are flat out wrong, but also that just don't please you. The ways that maybe we've partnered with the enemy to get what we want, God, it's not honoring to you. And it shouldn't be said of the people who are after your heart. So please help us to elevate your ways above our ways. And God, that as we walk with you, we would be excited at the opportunity we have to confess and repent any of the mistakes that we make so that we can be whole. How awesome you are that you would provide all these avenues for us to have relationship with you. 
And so God, I just pray for anyone who has yet to make that decision, who doesn't yet have a relationship with you, but who is feeling a tug at their heart that maybe now is when they need to surrender their life to you. I pray that they would say yes to you, believing that Jesus, you lived and you died to help make a way back to God for them. And that you also rose from the dead, defeating death forever. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And that you'll go with us into what is to come. The things you are calling us to that are yet unseen, but that we would step into them with deep roots of great faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's it for me. We'll talk to you soon.